Welcome to Security Weekly's Virtual Hacker Summer Camp 2020. I am your host, Matt Alderman. Joining me for this interview segment is James Pavor. He's a PhD candidate, I don't think you're a student, uh, at Oxford University. We're going to talk satellite broadband security or the lack of. James, welcome. Hey, so I am a PhD student. Um, so, but um, yeah, so my research is mostly looking at the security of satellite broadband communications. And um, at Black Hat this week, and also at DEF CON this upcoming weekend, I'll be presenting the results of about two years of experiments that we've been running, looking at how people use satellite internet in kind of real world practice and what that means for their security. And it's kind of summarizes several different separate research projects that looked at domains. So we looked at terrestrial users of satellite broadband, maritime users and aviation users. And what we found is that a lot of the protocols being used, um, especially to geostationary orbit satellites, were leaking internet traffic and clear text over these vast kind of signal coverage areas. Interesting. Now, in the United States, we only have a couple uh, satellite broadband services. Are there a lot more used over in, in Europe and in, in the UK? So I think that there are quite a few satellite providers that focus on Europe, as well as some global providers. So you might think like, uh, like Inmarsat, for example, is more or less a global provider as well as Intelsat. And then you have some European specific ones as well. Um, but from where I was in the UK um, and in Europe in general, so where we were recording this data, you can actually see satellites from very far away. So we were able to see satellites that were sending signals to customers in the Caribbean, parts of China, parts of India, from our, our single basically home television dish in Europe. Now you used uh, uh, you were using home television technology to intercept these signals, and that is because I assume they can uh, uh, monitor satellite traffic since that's how kind of TVs work. Is that the basis for uh, what equipment you use for this research? Yeah, so it turns out that satellite internet kind of evolved in a very weird way. Um, most of the satellite internet that was around in like the early 2000s used a protocol called MPEG, um, which is also used for video streaming a lot and had additional layers kind of hacked into it to enable interactivity for people to like pause their satellite television. And then they added additional features that became internet services that allows you to send packetized data. And so a lot of these satellites that are essentially television satellites have either been repurposed or have as an additional feature the capacity to offer internet services from geostationary orbit. And then there have been some newer protocols that kind of build off of that um, as well. And so home television equipment is often all you need to actually be able to do like the physical work of interpreting these satellite signals. And then the rest of it is just kind of software-based interpretation of the underlying protocols. Interesting. So it, it, un, like other security kind of technologies, right, if we think about it, is you take a standard technology, you add some capabilities to it. And it sounds like when they did that, it also created some security holes when they added some of these new capabilities on to these signals. Is, is that kind of what your, your research found? Yeah, so I guess these systems were not designed with internet service in mind, really. And then they were definitely not designed with secure internet services in mind. And that kind of design debt makes it very hard to create a fresh system that would have uh, the sort of security properties that we would expect for modern use cases. Right, and, and so your research now, are all satellite services the same? Do they use these same protocols kind of uh, across the board? Is that kind of standardized? Or are there some that actually do a better job of security in, in this satellite communication? That's a good question. So there definitely aren't global standards for this. Uh, we looked at specifically a protocol called DVBS or Digital Video Broadcasting for Satellite. And then two layers on top of that. One was that MPEG kind of video streaming format I mentioned earlier. And the other is something called Generic Stream Encapsulation or GSE. And these are some of the most popular protocols for servicing um, customers from geostationary orbit, but they're, not, they're definitely not the only ones. And while my research focuses on providers who were able to identify as offering unencrypted services. There are definitely satellite ISPs out there that offer encrypted services as well. Um, for example, I think some of the Astra satellites uh, offer encrypted services either as an additional service offering that you pay extra for, or sometimes by default, depending on kind of what you subscribe to. Right. And, and when you add encryption to satellite services, I assume that also 
provide some limitation and bandwidth. It, so is that why it's kind of an extra thing? Because it it's going to create some some level of uh, uh, limitations with bandwidth, right? Yeah. So actually, the um, biggest problem with geostationary orbit and encryption is that it's really far away. And you might think that like once you encrypt data, it doesn't really matter how far you're sending it. Um, and that's generally true, but certain ways that we encrypt data. So specifically, if we think about a TCP three-way handshake, to like start an internet session, you have to send a message up to space and then send a response to space and then send it back. And that whole process takes around 700 milliseconds, uh, which is why you can't do something like a video chat over a satellite feed without it feeling like super laggy and latent. And what internet service providers have done is they've essentially developed these proxies that are benevolent man in the middle attackers on their customers' connections. Mm. And they're constantly modifying your packets to speed up those handshakes and to make the traffic feel better over satellite. The problem is that if you use something like end-to-end -end VPN encryption, it breaks that benevolent man in the middle attack and makes your satellite internet suddenly feel really slow, mm. which has been a major barrier to kind of deploying standard encryption approaches in these networks. Right, yeah, and so, these relays are 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 the relays where the the potential um, attack can can happen since they're relaying the data. They're playing a man in the middle, right? Is, is that where the susceptibility of some of these communications are, based on your research? Um, so most of the communications issues are over the air on the forward link. So mm. that's the link that comes from the satellite in space down to the customer on the Earth's surface. Um, and because satellites are so expensive, um, you send this on a really wide kind of cone beam that covers uh, like 20 to 30% of the Earth's surface in some cases. And so anyone sitting inside that footprint can get the radio signals that are carrying that information. And if they can interpret those signals and the customer isn't encrypting that data and the internet service provider isn't, then it's just a kind of standard eavesdropping attack. Where the man in the middle part comes into play is I talk a little bit about this in uh, the briefings this week uh, is using things like TCP session hijacking attacks, because you can also kind of replicate what the ISP is doing and potentially impersonate endpoints inside of those networks. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So now you're, you're, you're taking over some of the communications kind of playing that, that access point in the middle uh, and probably makes it a little easier to get some of that communication than trying the, the wide range, you know, signal hijack in, through the air. Yeah, so by being a man in the middle attacker, you can sometimes see the other direction of the communication because the big wide signal is only the forward link. So it's only kind of like if you say, get me google.com, I could get the contents of google.com, but I couldn't get that original request because it's not sent on the signal that hits my dish. Oh, if it. I'm a man in the middle attacker and I can convince you that I'm google.com, then I can get both sides of that conversation. So in the unencrypted satellite communications, then it's, it's from the satellite down that is the most susceptible for over the air hijacking is that is that what i just heard yes yeah, so it's that forward link from the satellite to the customer and that's because the the antenna footprints are really big right now what would it, uh, encryption obviously solves aspects of this i think right uh it, it does have its challenges are there other things that can be done to protect that communication, or is encryption the only way to really solve this, this uh, signal uh, hijacking? So I think at a fundamental level, encryption is the only way to protect against eavesdropping attacks in any network. That said, some of the specific active attacks we talk about, like the TCP session hijacking attacks, can be mitigated by changing the way that internet service providers use those um, kind of man in the middle snooping proxies. Um, if they also change TCP sequence numbers so that the ones in the air are different than the ones on the ground, for example, they could mitigate the attack. Got it. Now, obviously home users that are using home satellite are susceptible, but there's a few industries that also use satellite communications that are also potentially vulnerable as well. Uh, maritime ships, uh, I think aircraft, uh, like if you get on the Wi-Fi on an airplane, that's all satellite communication too, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so in the talk, we cover um, several different domains and we look at terrestrial communications and it's not just home users there, but we also find that a lot of critical infrastructure uses satellites. So we'll talk a little bit about like power systems that happen to use satellite feeds and how you could compromise them based off of the data. We also do look at the maritime industry, so like cargo vessels and cruise lines and offshore oil rigs, 
that are leaking pretty deeply sensitive data, ranging from like passwords to emails. And then we found that in-flight Wi-Fi services um, were leaking over the satellite feeds, as well as some avionics equipment that was kind of more geared towards the people who were flying the plane. Interesting. Now, I, I, I would imagine airplanes get a little interesting, right? Uh, um, because they're moving at a high speed. They're also up in elevation. Does that change how you would snoop that traffic? Or it doesn't matter is because it's such a wide net anyways that it, it still doesn't matter that it's moving faster at a higher elevation? Yeah, it doesn't matter at all. So because of the way that satellites, those specific satellites I'm looking at in geostationary orbit work, uh, they kind of, there's not like a deeply nuanced approach. The satellites are more or less just like dumb bent pipes that take a signal that they get from the internet service provider on the ground and just say it basically as loud and as wide as they can mm. to serve as many customers as possible. Got it. And so any aircraft pretty much in that net, all their communications could be hijacked because of that wide kind of broad net that's being cast down from the satellite. Right. Yeah. The same radio waves are serving both aircraft. They're just picking which ones they want to listen to with their modems. Interesting. Uh, what kind of recommendations would you have for the satellite providers to mitigate aspects of this? Is it just encryption and, and we're done? <laughs> So we present in the paper a tool that we're working on that's kind of a combination of the snooping proxies with a VPN sort of tool that's based off of a protocol called QUIC, which is a TCP replacement, and that we think fixes a lot of those problems. Um, and that's just like an open source proof of concept tool that an internet service provider could use, but also that like an individual customer who is worried about their security could use, which is somewhat unusual in the satellite space. Uh, but our tool definitely isn't the only way to approach it. I think that Understanding that just adding encryption to networks is not necessarily trivial, but that if you consider the physical properties of satellites specifically, you can often repurpose solutions the security community has already been able to come up with in a way that fits this kind of performance and privacy trade-off that has historically stopped encryption in satellite networks. Right, yeah. No, I think the findings are interesting. You know, there was a lot of research done a few years ago about the Wi-Fi on the airplanes, but they were looking at it from in the plane itself. I don't, I don't know anybody that's really looked at the communications from outside the plane. And, and your research is really showing where the vulnerabilities are from the satellite communication it, you know, outside of the aircraft or even outside of a, a, a vessel, for example, uh, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, I think that's definitely the strangest part for us. And I think the most interesting takeaway was that you might connect to a Wi-Fi hotspot and it'll look like it's using WPA2 and it's super secure. And, you know, your browser uses TLS encryption or whatever. And you're like, no one can listen to me. But the next hop down the line could be over a satellite signal or a tapped Ethernet cable or something. And so unless you're really sure that you're encrypting everything, except maybe like your IP headers, someone is going to get information out of those packets if they're in the right spot within kind of the weird mesh that's the internet. Yeah, I think it's a really good lesson for people that use Wi-Fi on the airplane that not all of their communication is fully secured. Uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, use case for, for people to think about. I don't use it that often. I only use it when I have to, but I know a lot of business people will use the Wi-Fi um, airplane uh connection to, to work while they're on the plane, not realizing that there is potentially a vulnerability in that communication. Yeah, we saw all kinds of business communication. So it was a little hard this year to get airplane traffic due to coronavirus, um, which was nice in some ways because we only got really important traffic that was related to the airplanes themselves. But we also did see the occasional business communication, mm -hmm. like emails that were going to an accountant for some firm or discussions about whatever like contract is being signed for uh, specific piece of infrastructure. And so there definitely is sensitive business communication. And that only when I have to dynamic that applies to airplane internet means that we tend to get more interesting communications than we get from, say, people on cruise ships or people at land. Right. Yeah. Because yeah, if you're on a cruise ship, it's probably for personal reasons, maybe not that sensitive, but on an airplane, it could be very business sensitive communications that you're actually doing that you think are secure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. James, when is your session at Black Hat? So the session is at 12.30 on Wednesday, um, Pacific time. Awesome. If anybody wants to check out that session, I highly recommend it. I think the research is great. James, thank you so much for joining us on Security Weekly. No problem. This is fun.
And with that, we'll take a break and we'll come back with more interviews soon. <laughs> 